Got it. All right, good. Hey, welcome back. This is Microsoft Virtual Academy. This is Module 6. We're talking about the jump start for C Sharp. This is exam 70483. We were just talking about encryption. We were just talking about, what was the last thing we were talking about? Um, I have no idea. I think it was encryption. Yeah, cr encryption definitely. What yeah. was before that? Oh, it was all the trust stuff, remember? Exactly. Yeah, we yeah. had all the data. All right, now we've got some more things to talk about. Darren, what's going on in this module? So this module, we're going to be talking about splitting assemblies. All right. And the relationship to assemblies and projects. And we're also going to start talking about diagnostics and instrumentation. OK, brilliant. Well, let's get started. Let's dive in. All right, so I guess we can't use terms without defining them, such as predicate, for example. So let's do define some of these terms. All right, assembly. Assembly. What is an assembly? Um, I, I just I, wanted to put a shout out to uh, Frank and say, hey, your time is great. Yeah. Oh, hey, yeah. Oh. He is killing it with that. <laughs> he has got it going on. <laughs> All right, no, no, seriously. What is an assembly? You're welcome, man. An assembly is a container for a set of resources and types. That's a kind of a sterile way of saying it, but it is totally true. If I were inside Visual Studio and I had my solution open, I would open up a, I would add projects to that solution. In a sense, a solution is a container for projects. Projects, however, is a one-to-one -one for what an assembly is. It's a container of all my code. It's a container of all my resources. I can have more than one. They can, they can re reference each other. And by that, they can talk to each other. There's a lot of value in, in assemblies to logically or really physically group my code together into a, a single place. We can have multiple files for an assembly. That's quite a bit of work. The general assembly, the general assembly is just a <laughs> single file. It's just saying I feel like we're at this is yeah, it's like United Nations General exactly. Assembly here. Here we are. Exactly. Um, and so there's so is that more to that. Like a DLL or an executable? I mean, how, when you talk about files, how, what are they? Well, it, you know, the answer is yes. All right. An assembly is whatever your project ends up being. Um, it could be a it could be an EXE, right? If you're creating a some sort of executable, okay. absolutely. Could be a DLL, absolutely. It could be just a library that you reference into your project. Mm -hmm. It could even be a WinMD, and we'll talk about that as a, a, a Windows component that we could create for uh, Windows 8 using Windows Runtime. All right, beautiful. Um, great. The, uh, there is a, a little bit of, I, I, it's not really a confusion, Darren, but it is a, kind of a, some, some, a balancing act between namespaces and assemblies. So if I were talking about specifically a namespace, or um, specifically a, an, an assembly, that's a file. right? And yep. uh, even though it could be broken, let's just talk about it as a single file. Yep, single a file. namespace is logical, where an assembly is physical, a namespace is logical, it could span not just multiple files, multiple assemblies as well. It's just a way of grouping logically all of the code, all the classes, all the work that we're doing into one place that might span different files. Could so, we also have multiple namespaces within a single assembly? Right. So in a, just like a namespace can be across assemblies, and a single assembly can hold any number of namespaces, because a namespace is such a simple little container, it has no functionality, just a grouping is all that it really is. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that, was, that was only mildly distracting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that's what that is. We have somebody who's suddenly playing music in the back of the room. No, I think he's watching the video, uh, and it's just that he's a handful of seconds behind. Oh, that's right? awesome. Yeah, that's why it sounded so good. I think it was my voice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't believe that for a moment. The fidelity was beautiful. Okay. All right. Back Let's on target. Namespaces, namespaces and assemblies. All right. Um, for sure, a, 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 an assembly defines a scope. It defines where things can be executed, just like a namespace can define a much larger scope. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm inside a namespace, often that's a domain, and uh, we can stay inside it. And so that's... If I were trying to pick between a namespace and I was trying to pick between an assembly, more often than not, all the code you have will end up being in an assembly when it's geared towards a specific uh, platform. It's geared towards having a specific set of, say, logic. I'll create an assembly of type uh, library whenever it's something reused across all of my applications. And I might have an assembly that is like an executable or some mm -hmm. sort of um, UI whenever I'm building the UI. So give me an example of what you mean by namespaces. Uh, so. A great example of namespace are the ones that come with the fr framework, mm -hmm. like System. Right? System is certainly a namespace that spans many different assemblies. Um, System.file, right? 
So we know that that's a, that's a subname space, but it's, system.file is the namespace. And so we are able to then have all of the file related um, uh, classes and extension methods and pieces like that all contained together. And I could put them all inside a single assembly if I want to. In this case, they do. Mm -hmm. So I would have a namespace that would be, um, when I'm creating, say, a Windows 8 application, I'll have uh, view models inside my XAML application. And often, I'll have a view model namespace. Not only is it nice to have them all contained that way, but it's an easy way to find them, too. Whenever you're looking for something that does file I.O., it's neat to be able to go system.file, right? Or system.io.file yep. and be able to see all of it there. And uh, so, it's, it's, so it's not, I mean, eventually, a large application is going to have a lot of code, a lot of methods, a lot of classes, a lot of things you can interact with. This is an easy way to find them and a nice way to kind of keep your code clean. It really is more about just um, discoverability and cleanliness of your of your code than anything else. So we also mentioned that you know you can spread your namespace across uh, multiple assemblies. Give me an example of why would we want to do that? Uh, why would you want to split up what by giving it the same namespace, you're kind of implying that these things should be grouped together. So why would we have different? Assemblies? Well, that's a great point. Um, I might have a, I may have a foundational namespace that goes across my entire company, and so then I would have, let's say, I work for Acme. Uh, let's say I work for Microsoft. I would say Microsoft. You do work for Microsoft. I yeah. Are you a company shill like I am? Uh, no. Well, I am for my company. Ah, very nice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Crank to All right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, don't mind if I mention it now. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so I might have you know a namespace that refers to my company. It's a, it's often common for your company to be the first namespace in a longer one, and uh, you know dot my application, but my application breaks into different pieces. There's a um, there's a web component that sits on all the services where I have you know WCF services. Let's say I also have a a WPF client as well, and then I also have a Windows 8 client and a Windows Phone client. They really do all share similar namespaces, but I've broken them into separate assemblies because they actually don't belong to each other. When I write code specifically for WCF uh, or WPF, either one, I'm not going to share between them the exact same the UI logic on the service service or the service mm -hmm. logic or database logic on the UI, but they will maintain that same namespace for the continuity of it as well. So what will happen is I'll still be able to say, uh, you know, company dot application dot, and then be able to drill into whatever's local and referenced inside that project. So it allows me to keep some sanity around a lot of code and still be able to have a con uh, consistent way of interacting with it, but not necessarily have all of it in one place mm -hmm. and because it just doesn't belong there. The stuff I do on the phone doesn't belong on the server. Yeah. Oh, and there's another advantage as well. Let's say, for example, you're writing unit tests, which mm -hmm. I hope everybody is. You could create a subname space which contains all your unit tests. You have them as part of your application itself uh, during your in your development environment where you're running your unit tests all the time. But you may elect not to ship the DLL, the assembly that contains those unit tests. Yeah. So you would take your unit tests and extract them out to their own assembly. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You wouldn't want to ship your unit tests. I've seen some that do. Yeah. I've seen a could, lot of things. Could actually, part of uh, your installation validation, you could run your unit tests in it, for example. Yeah. It's pretty cool. That's an interesting idea, actually. Mm -hmm. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's only because it's a good idea. Yeah, I hate everything good. That's the truth. All right. Um, and then, so, so there, there certainly is a difference, but it's easy to, to misunderstand. And mm -hmm. you could actually wonder, you know, you're in system looking for something that doesn't exist. You have a reference to that namespace. You would think it's all there, but it's not. You can actually expand the namespace as you reference more assemblies. One of the interesting things is, you know, we were talking about encryption, and we were talking about hashing, and we were talking about signing. You know, if we've got these assemblies that are being shared publicly, and they're, they are supposed to do something, how do we trust? that we've got something that is actually uh, going to do what we purchased it to do. How do we know that somebody hasn't put some nefarious code and shipped it out as the same assembly name? Well, that's a great point, and it is a dangerous situation if you think about it. I could be buying a, comp a suite of components from somebody to make my application look really cool. I get it, but I'm downloading it you know, f from some nefarious operator, mm -hmm. and I get it. It looks just like it, but little do I know it's actually a backdoor into my application. Yeah, that is a dangerous piece. How do we solve it? It goes back to kind of what we were talking about with yeah. encryption. Explain it to us a little bit. So basically, you, know, you can have an assembly, and you can mark that it should be strong named. Mm. So strong naming will allow you to go in and specify a particular private key that will be used during the compilation process. The, the Visual Studio and the compilation environment would inject into that assembly a signature. 
and that signature could only be produced via the key that you have available. If you've purchased this key from a trusted source, then you are digitally signing that uh, assembly with your um, identifier so that a consumer can verify that this assembly has originated from you. It is also a prerequisite that uh, assemblies have to be digitally signed before you can install them into the global assembly cache. What's that? And when we say strongly named, we're basically saying signed. Exactly. We're basically saying that we have incorporated into this a uh, contract that expressly guarantees that this, app, this uh, assembly is from whom it's, we say it is. Yeah, and so GAC, what you were talking about before, the Global Assembly Cache. So we all have it. Uh, the Global Assembly Cache is in the Windows folder. It is where reused assemblies go, and they, they are, they're at a global scope. They're then usable by anything that's installed. Very, very similar to registering a DLL back in the comm days. What's special about it is um, different versions of these assemblies can sit side by side. And so once they're side by side, it means I'm no longer version dependent. I can use whichever one that I need to and uh, it kind of removes that I don't know DLL hell that they always talked about where you some program would need to update to get the latest version so they could have its functionality meanwhile other applications which relied on those older features or relied on things not to be the way they were in the newer versions get broken so the GAC solves that by allowing them to be side by side but the main purpose of the GAC is really to create a a global a globally referenced set of Assemblies. Okay, so fundamentally we can put a using statement at the top of our source files and we should be able to access them without having to worry about making sure they've been installed for our specific application. Yeah, that's right. Now there, there certainly, it will not be in the GAC if it, you haven't put it there, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there are some that just ship with Windows, and you have quite a few, all, all the system ones, of course. Um, but uh, you know, if you have one and you want to put it so that it can be re reused across all the different applications you're releasing, say for your enterprise, mm -hmm. it's your responsibility to put it in the GAC. You can use GPO to do that too, of course, and it will. Is that group policy? That is group policy. It can, it can put that into it for all, all. Your, you don't have to go from machine to machine. Okay, so that's kind of an IT administration activity. It it is. Okay. I hate to talk about that sort of thing. Exactly. On a yeah. dev Go wash show. your mouth out. Yeah, but uh, nonetheless, once it's in the GAC, then we can reference it globally. And it, w the ben benefit of having it like that is not just reuse, but it also allows the deployment of my application to the different desktops to be much smaller. I don't have to always include every reference to mm -hmm. assembly. Okay. And also, when you purchase, say, vendor toolkits, mm -hmm. their installer may well install their assemblies into the GAC for you, so you don't have to worry about doing that. It's true, and the, it, it's a it's a common. Uh, um, accident that developers will ship thinking that it's in everybody's GAC when it is really only, only in theirs. In theirs, which is kind of scary. Yeah. Same for source code control. I've never done that, but I have heard of developers making that mistake. Yeah. Yeah. N nobody this side of the camera has ever made that sort of mistake. Mm -mm. <laughs> we have a session later, you know, on debugging. It was really, I had to learn a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've never opened Debugger. It just runs what first time. What do you do with that? I, Why I, would you need it? Okay. Yeah. All right. So now back to sharing assemblies. Exactly. I mean, this is the real point is I'll create a shim an assembly. Uh, I mean, you can't get away from an assembly. One project is an assembly, and so you can't have a project without one. But the reason I would create multiple is probably for sharing and reuse, right? Being able to hand, hand across. If I were inside the same .NET framework, then I don't really have to worry. I can create a, um, a library, a, a, um, a code library, class library, and I can share to kind of to my heart's content. And an individual uh, assembly can have other assembly dependencies, and they all ship together. You can't just bring one over and doesn't wrap all the assemblies. Because there is actually it. a disadvantage to using lots and lots of assemblies, mm -hmm. because they all have to be loaded when you start your application, especially if you've got hard and fast uh, references that need those things during startup. And so there are actually many patterns of application development whereby uh, you actually have dynamically loaded modules that are done during runtime. Yeah, that's powerful. And, you all, and, and the opposite is, is a good practice for developers too, where after they're finished with their application, to start looking at the references inside their project yep. and removing them so that they don't have that extra memory burden. Exactly. And it's it's costly in memory and and boot time or, or mm -hmm. you know startup time for their application. Yeah. So one one of the scenarios is you know we create these say class libraries yeah. that share these shareable components and you know I I built stuff in WPF and I'm referencing all these WPF uh, capabilities and I've got all this logic and all of a sudden you know I'm building something say for the App Store yeah and I've got all this logic and 
I can't reference this assembly. They're totally unrelated, aren't they? they they're incompatible with each other. Yeah. And so Why you, is that? Well, partly because they're built on different frameworks. And so when I write something for the desktop, I'm using the .NET framework. When I'm writing something, say, for the phone, I'm using the framework for the phone. And when I'm writing something, let's say, for uh, Windows Store apps, like you were alluding to, I would be using WinRT. All of those are very similar, and they give developers a similar experience. But they certainly are different technologies in reality. Mm. And so as I build one for one, one for another. They are incompatible with each other, but we've solved the problem. Oh. Solved the problem with portable class libraries. So wow. that's well named. It is because it's portable and it's they a class library. are class libraries. <laughs> yeah, it's all fantastic. And um, a portable class library, often the shorthand is just PCLs. So you'll create a PCL, and what it allows you to do is to, it, it feels just like a class library, by the mm -hmm. way, and uh, it interacts just like a class library, but it generates a common denominator. So, for example, let's say you're writing an application for Xbox, you're writing an application for the phone, and you're writing an application for the desktop. Now, for the desktop, you have everything, because that's like the that's the big mama. But all these others have their own limitations. Is that a technical term? It is. Uh, it's on page 42. Okay, awesome. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, Anyway, so the reality is, lots of the functionality that's on the desktop is not in the Xbox, right? And so, as a result, because it's a portable class library, you can only include technology that is true for both. And so now, regardless of the fact that it's supported on the desktop, the portable class class library removes capabilities inside oh, the PCL. So I can specify what platforms I want to target on that port yep, portable Yep, that's library. exactly right. As okay. a, when I create a new one, it lists all the platforms and I select the ones I want. Excellent. Every one I select reduces more functionality, right? It can get pr Potentially. Brutal. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah, I mean, the, for example, uh, you know, reference to uh, directory services, right, is mm -hmm. not available when I'm on the phone. It doesn't, you know, and yep. references to uh, other subsystems like that are often not available when I'm on Xbox or when I go to a web client or something like that. Okay, so some couple of best practices to think about then for using these portable class libraries. They should be focused mainly on behavior, functionality, and so on, and not necessarily necessarily system level interactions. Mm. You know, it, there could be uh, data shapes, you know, my data objects, my business rules applying to those data objects. They may perhaps define contracts yeah. that interact with systems and we can use things like dependency injection and so on and so forth to abstract out the implementation of those services. Right. But it's more of a a concept. Yeah, the the in, um, you know there's a pattern interface design, and um, that's a that's an important pattern when you use PCLs because often now here's an example of I, I could build an, a console application and I've, I I have a PCL for it and I create a service reference out to a web server that's really handy but um, now I've included the capability of say Windows Phone 8 Windows Phone 8 doesn't have that capability mm -hmm. so now in order for me to still be able to interact with it now I have to handle instead an interface Face, allowing each of the systems that consumes it to pass a reference to it using just the interface. So uh, these kind of design patterns are just things you, you can't get away from when you're using a PCL because it's the as you start making it a lower common denominator, you're going to have to work around that so you don't lose all the functionality and there's no reason to share code in the first place. Absolutely. Yeah. Great guidance. Thanks. Now, Windows 8 is a little bit different, and it's a, it's not really a portable class library. It's not really it is a class library for sure, um, but it's specific to Windows 8 store applications, and uh, those are WinMDs or uh, Windows component libraries, right? WinMD is the Windows metadata. It's really okay. describing everything that's inside this library. And uh, so I would create a WinMD not because I want to share with other platforms. I would create a WinMD because the logic that I have inside my library should be shared with other languages. So, I mean, there's a whole mess of like snakes here, but the reality is this. <laughs> if you're writing a Windows 8 application, you have choices as far as languages that you use. Just like if you're writing a desktop application, you have choices as far as languages that you use. And in the case of Windows 8, I could write it in C++, C++ CX, or I could write it in a .NET language like VB or C Sharp. But I could also choose JavaScript. All three of those, and we want to give um, 
we want to support in parity all of those different languages. And mm -hmm. the way that's accomplished is through a Windows component library, which basically takes your code down to a lower level that can be, and we use the word projected, into all the other languages. So I can write something in C sharp that I can take down to a Windows component level that can be projected up into a JavaScript application and used in complete parity. It can also be projected up into C sharp, I could also, or into C++. I could also go the other way. I could say I could write it in C++, which is a common scenario. Mm -hmm. You know, they, like game developers may have a lot of their game logic in C++. So they bring all that logic down into a Windows component, which is actually quite rich and capable. Yep. And then they can expose it to JavaScript developers. A lot of power there. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it's very similar to uh, the value of the unified type system and the ability to write something in C Sharp and absolutely. share with VB in the managed world. But it's a different infrastructure that is tailored to support the Windows App Store environment. It is a, that is a great way to say it. It is a different in infrastructure tailored just for the Windows App Store. And they are foundational types rather than uh, you know common types. Yep. But same concept all the way around. And uh, the, the point is foundational types can be translated into the consuming technology. So mm -hmm. uh, you may, you know, you know, whatever types you interact with on, in C++, when they are projected up into C Sharp, they're .NET types like I would expect. And when I interact with it with JavaScript, those are the, they, they interact with, I interact with types that I would expect in JavaScript as well. So those those are WinMDs. In fact, I have a I have a little walkthrough here. I want to um, I want to do that. Let me pull up a uh, my Visual Studio here, and you know what? Let me let me start from scratch. It's kind of fun to do that sometimes. Okay. And uh, I'll I'll start a Windows 8 app. Can we see his? Uh and so that's the whole demo. What'd you guys think? No, just kidding. <laughs> that was for you, Barry. All right. Uh, all right, so I'm going to create a new app. Ah, <laughs> oh, the power. <laughs> I'm going to create a new application here, but it's going to be, I want to I want to demonstrate WinMD specifically. So um, I could, uh, here we go. So I'll create a, a XAML application. And so a simple XAML application using C Sharp, I'll go in and uh, I'll start building out a, uh, a, an easy UI. And so let me just do that real quickly. I'll say, uh, I'll, I'll use a tool, I'll just build it out with the designer. And let me see, uh, how about a tool box, or text box, there we go. Text box, and maybe a, another text box here. I'm gonna add a, I'm gonna add a quick, uh, text block so I can just have some simple text here and then a button so this is cool uh, the the entire designer for uh, Windows 8 development matches the experience that you would have in blend because it's the same code base for the designer it's really rich and nice I'll add a, a button here or a button I mean there we go it's something to cause the action to happen and then we'll have some sort of result right there very nice and uh, so let me give everything a quick name so that I can talk to it um, this will be and we'll make it real this will be T1 uh, this will be T2 these are terrible names by the way Darren and T3 <laughs> terrible names. not a not a best practice not what I was intending to show there all right so uh, let's make this the um, in fact, let me make You're that. a dev designer, aren't you? I'm I can tell designer. just from that UI. I'm an awesome dev designer. Are you kidding me? <laughs> 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 nice indeed. All right, so uh, there we are. I, there's the uh, plus. This is going to be an addition application. So I'll go in here. I'll say let's default it to one and two. Well, that's not two. And then uh, this will be the res where the result goes. We'll make this three. All right, so it's just simple enough. I just wanted everything to have some default data. Here's the button. Uh, the button obviously should not say button. It should just say equals or calculate or something like that. And um, let's see. I'll also make it nice and big as well. Let's see. That's probably too big. There we go. All right, good enough. I'll have a handler then for this. And I'll say, when it's actually clicking, I want it to process the two values, and I want it to add them together. Now, I know that that logic is too sophisticated for me to allow it to be rewritten over and over again. So instead, I'm going to add another project here. And I'll say, add new project. And I'll go again to Windows Store inside C Sharp. But I'll take instead the Windows Runtime component. And this Windows Runtime component, here we are, is going to have class one, and I'll just leave its name for now, and I'm going to create a, uh, a static method. That's just so I don't have to new it up every time. And uh, I will create a static method called uh, 
sum them up, all right, just like so. And it's going to take in two values. And uh, boy, I've got all kinds of problems because I'm doing a terrible job. There we go. All right, it'll pass in value one, and it'll also accept value two. Now, I know in all reality this is simple logic, but just imagine that there is a computational piece here, and it is the sort of thing you don't want all of your logic to be repeated, tested twice. Instead, you want to reuse it. And so now I'll just uh, return uh, v1 plus v2. Simple enough. So far, so good? So far, so good. Is there any restrictions on what we can return back? Yeah, there really are. Now, there are fewer restrictions, of course, when you create a class library. But uh, a, because this is a Windows component and it's going to be brought down and shared, there are several rules to make sure it doesn't become incompatible with mm. the other languages. Um, one of them is that we can't use generics. We, we don't want to expose generics or require generics to be passed in, because not all languages support generics. Um, we can certainly use generics inside the implementation. We okay. just can't have that as some of the exposed pieces. So we also wouldn't tr want to try and expose return like an anonymous type or anything along those lines. Right, anything that is specific to one language is, okay. not, is something that you shouldn't do. Um, also, when I create a class, it, uh, all of its members need to be public. There actually are several rules that we go through. I mean, probably about six, right? Six rules that we go, to, that go through to make sure that you don't write a Windows component that is invalid. The nice thing here, though, is the, construct, the compiler's on your side again. OK, right? compiler's awesome. You are not going to be able to write a component that is incompatible and build it. <laughs> That's the, you can write it, but it, you won't be able to build it. All right. Okay. So That's here, awesome. this is my. Uh this is my reused logic. Let me, let me kind of nuke some of the stuff that's here so we can have, I don't, I don't like having too much so it looks like it's real complex when it's not. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's uh, the button one handler. This is my project, app one. I'm going to add a reference. And then when I do, I'll add only from this solution. And I can see here's my Windows runtime component. It's called Windows runtime component one. Again, an excellent naming convention. This is what I would recommend for everyone. Your muse has not yet deserted you, that's for sure. Yes, yes. It's, wow, that's great. All right, so here now, and you can see there are all the references sit side by side, and they're all indicated specifically on what types they are. The little boxes next to them show me that it's a Windows runtime component. If I were to add a class library specific to C Sharp, it would look, uh, it, has that, uh, it has a little box with a, the C Sharp next to it. <laughs> <laughs> would that be an icon it's of something? Yeah, it has an icon. Yeah. yeah. There's no color to confuse you. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. We got rid of all the confusing colors in Visual Studio, so that's one of the best parts. All right, so uh, now I, I can reference it directly. So if I say Windows Runtime, Runtime Component 1, this is me referencing or me making a referral, I suppose, to what I referenced in my application. And I can say dot, and I can see there's that class one. And I don't have to invoke it because I made it static. And so I can say dot again, and there's sum them up. It expects two things to come into it, it the val oh, two, two different values. So let me go ahead and get those from the text. Uh, let's see, it was t1.text. OK, whilst you're typing that, uh, we had a question that came in that talked about um, <laughs> Does the compiler remove unused references at the top? So one thing to bear in mind is those usings are just shorthand so that you don't have to type the full namespace. It is not a, uh, that is not what includes your references. If you could flick out to your references on your uh, solution there for a second. Yeah, let me jump up. So here we have a long list of namespaces that we've imported so that when we start typing a type, this is where the compiler checks to see if they've been implemented. If you look over into your references, in Science Solution, this is where you can add references to external assemblies and bring them in. If I if I add a reference to a, for an external assembly and never use it, it's still there even when it's I build. It's still there. It's still placed as a dependency for when this component is started up. So the compiler doesn't. Uh, take into account and ro roll all the way through your code to say don't uh, use these references. There are actually third-party plugins such as uh, ReSharper and some other tools that can do that for you and remove unused references, but that's not something that's baked in. Great question, thank you. So here's the implementation, just three quick lines. I needed to parse the text to turn it into the right type of a double. And uh, so I have my double and uh, my two doubles. I pass them in to sum them up. It returns it. I just convert it quickly to a Hang string on. so that You're I can set it. You're passing T1 text to both of those? Is that what you wanted to do? No, I'm actually mean T2. I appreciate that. You're welcome. 
because it would be nothing more embarrassing than having an ad method that didn't oh, add properly. <laughs> I could think of something more embarrassing. And so, um, and, and then I just set it, set it in there. Now, so if I were to run it, and I'll go ahead and run it. The nice thing is that logic, and again, I re recognize it's actually very simple logic, is right here, it's abstracted out into a reusable class, into a reusable assembly. This is a special assembly that is not meant to be reused from app to app, but reused, reused across languages, app mm -hmm. to app, which is very special. But you could use it app to app as well if you wanted to. You could use it just like a class library. Yeah. But unfortunately, not unfortunately, but just the reality is, you would still have to obey those rules, mm -hmm. and you can't go break it for other languages even if no other language actually works. So I'm going to hit debug and let it uh, run on this local machine. Here's my beautiful UI that I put together. One plus two equals, and um, I'll blank this out so I can actually see that it runs, and then it comes back to three. Awesome. Let me show you something. If I said one point that plus two dot one, that also works. Ooh, I just wanted to prove it wasn't magic. smoke and mirrors. That's just magic. Demos are never Al realistic. What happens if you put Fred in there? It uh, it would not parse, <laughs> and this and it would. And we would it, get an exception. It, we would get an exception so right where it tries to parse. So you were paranoid. You did not protect yourself from some no. user. It's because I know who the user is. Exactly, and, and that's why you should have protected. He's them. trustworthy. <laughs> he's trustworthy. He's my favorite user so far. He's the one who doesn't try all the edge cases. All right. So let me add another project. So here's a second project, but this time I'm not going to go to C Sharp Windows Store. This time I'm going to go down to other languages, JavaScript Windows Store. Goodness. I wonder if Palermo's still on. He's, he's dancing a happy jig right now. Uh, you know what? He's probably, yeah, that's right. Never has he seen me write a JavaScript app. Uh, but I'm not entirely sure he's going to yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, it's easy. It's easy not to like you very much. All right, so. All right, here's, the H here's, my, here's my UI. It's a simple little UI. I'm going to just throw it together really quickly okay. because um, I don't want to do a bunch of HTML anything. Okay. That's just because I'm a XAML guy. You know what I mean? Thanks. But Here's the reality is different applications need different technologies. Different development teams need different technologies. That's just the way it goes. Yeah. For me, it's XAML today. So and I'll there's create a, of, a... There's a lot of value in being conversant across different languages and different environments and so on. You know, in general, you know, as developers, we should strive to be competent across a number of different te uh, technologies because it really helps round out our experiences. And we can also understand where certain features come from. You know, we mentioned earlier on that contracts came from Eiffel. You know, there, there are a rich, rich source of different languages out there that really complement your skill sets. So if you've only focused on one language, I really do recommend looking across a broader scheme. Yeah, that's just good career advice. Exactly. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to give This is just the course that keeps on giving. Yeah, this, is a, this has become like a self-help kind of course. Exactly. Yeah. If you find that the technology seems stale, just try another technology. <laughs> exactly. All right, so uh, let's see. I, I want to give some default values as well equals two, and then we'll do it down here. Instead of three, which made it seem too easy, I'll set it to zero. All right, very good. Um, I need a, uh, let's see, I'll say on click. And then, uh, you know what, I, obviously, if I were writing a true HTML application, I know that I would separate everything out, CSS classes, Java, Java exactly. files, things like that. Uh, I'm not going to do that here, because it's a demo. Because it's a demo. Right. Know. And uh, so let me, uh, here we go. So let me call this in the on click here. Oops, uh, on click equals uh, do work. O R K. Everything look all right? It looks pretty good to me. Okay, just making sure. <laughs> all right, so just like our previous project, these all act exactly the same. So I made a reference in app one over to my Windows runtime component one. I'll need to do the same thing inside this one. Okay. So I'll go to its references. It's the same dialogue. I go to the solution, and they're all listed here. So wait, you're saying that this will be available in JavaScript? Now, yes, I'm going to say this is going to be available in JavaScript. That's you read my mind, or the slides, and so we. Uh, <laughs> well, there's something on the slides. So what's beautiful now is this this runtime component written in C sharp is about to be leveraged by a JavaScript application. So here I can say um, it'll be uh, Windows Windows runtime component one dot class one. Dot, this is the same experience as I was having over so on C-Sharp So you've C got Sharp IntelliSense side. as well. That's right. Uh, the tooling around JavaScript for Windows 8 development really is rich. I mean, it really is. But I want to show you something interesting. Here's my sum it up, or sum them up. But look what's special about it. It's not, it's not, is it hey. can't, 
Is that a different case? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, the, the convention for a JavaScript uh, is for the first letter in a method to be lowercase. And, uh, or, um, yes, in a method to be lowercase. And, but I didn't do it that way. If we were yeah. going to go back to it, you would see I would, I would have followed standard C-sharp notation instead. And so here I'll call sum them up. It's neat how it, this is all done by the projection. Again, I didn't write sum them up with a lowercase s. I actually created the metadata for it that was projected into JavaScript. Mm -hmm. It's very powerful. So this is interesting. So we're in JavaScript and we're consuming uh, something that's been implemented in, say, C Sharp. And you mentioned that we could do it in C++. Can JavaScript be used to produce a WinMD component that could be consumed by C Sharp? You cannot. So the only languages that can create WinMD files or Windows components are only uh, the .NET languages or C++. If you try to create it in JavaScript, uh, well, there's no way to do it. Okay. There, there's no option. Okay. In fact, I, I don't know if you remember that file new. When we went to JavaScript, there was one. Right, there was yeah. one option to choose from. Okay, so here we go. Um, now the the here I am. I'm calling it. I'm just breaking onto another line so it so it doesn't go too far over. And uh, I'll set uh, t3 yeah. dot value. So the v a l u e with the lowercase v. There we go. All right. So this is um, this logically is almost identical to the implementation of the budget but it, but of the logic that. Uh, <laughs> What is this? Can you help me? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own, Jack. The logic for the button click is almost identical to the logic that we implemented for And what we can actually see there is a very common sy syntactic root. Hmm. As we were talking about beforehand, how many of these languages are inspired from the same sort of foundational base, we can see that it's very much the same syntax there. Well, that's a great point, yeah, with open and closed little squirrely brackets. You're yep. absolutely right. All right, so this will run the same way. I'm going to set app 2 now to be my... Um, my startup project and go ahead and debug it. It'll deploy it out for me and run it. It's very similar looking. I didn't take any time to do anything fancy with it. One plus two equals. Now when I click on the equals button, it'll execute inside the runtime component again. The exact same logic that I'd saved from uh, before. And there is three. And if I were to put a decimal or whatever, it all works the same. That's amazing. And just like you said before, if I was going to put Fred, I would. it would fail. Mm -hmm. There's no reason for me to show a failure. <laughs> Just trust me, it'll fail. Right, there you go. Well, it, it's handled gracefully in JavaScript. Yeah. Because of the you dynamic should, typing. Yeah, yeah, you should, you should see it in C Sharp. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that is a WinMD. A WinMD is a Windows runtime component. It's what you can create spe specifically for Windows 8 app development. OK, so that's how we share code across languages. Class libraries are how we share code across assemblies or different projects. And then portable class libraries are how we share code across platforms, right? We're not specific to Windows 8, but specific to really the Windows, the Microsoft platform. This or is you want more the .NET ecosystem. Yeah. That, well, the .NET ecosystem is probably the best way to say yeah. it. Yeah. It doesn't go everywhere, but it certainly goes wherever find.net is sold. Indeed. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's moving on. Uh, we're going to touch on diagnostics and instrumentation right now. Another okay. important part of your application is and to I know make one sure of your personal favorites. It is. It really is. It's kind of like code contracts. Um, if you're going to write an application, you need to be able to make sure that it's a good experience for the user. Um, one way to do that is to design the UI, but another way to do it is to make sure that it performs properly. And now, being able to determine if your application is performing properly is difficult. It's very difficult. Odds are the developer that is creating it has a monster machine that is awesome. And it could load on almost any application, your application can almost any other device, and it's going to be less powerful than the developers. I mean, that's kind of a universal. Well, why truth. don't we just tell the users it's upgrade? <laughs> yeah, just get, get some more RAM, get some more. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But in case that doesn't happen, we can do some uh, profiling and analysis on your application for performance. How do we do that? Well, Let's talk about some of the terminology first because it's important. So it starts with instrumentation. Um, instrumentation is the part of the code that you include that stores performance information. So um, every time a method is run, you might 
want to have that as an instrumentation point where you log it, right? That's a possibility. Or perhaps when you call a database and it takes 10 seconds or it takes whatever seconds it is, you want to take that and that resulting number and let that be instrumentation pieces points as well. And so the instrumentation is just the practice by the developer to go into their code so that they can go to these specific points where performance might be measured and be able to contain those points or be able to expose those points so they can be stored somewhere and, and analyzed. So it's like web analytics, but for your code instead. It's like web analytics, but for your code. That's a great way awesome. to say it. And uh, and it's effort. This isn't automatic. Mm -hmm. um, there are other there are tools out there that will analyze your code. But the you best way to add performance. Um, uh, measurement to your code is for you to do it. You understand your code, not a generic, um, not a generic uh, analysis tool. Although those tools are very powerful. Yeah, I mean they can certainly do give you a lot of insight. But as you say, there's nothing better than intentionally introducing instrumentation into your application. So you have instrumentation that takes these data points and puts them out somewhere. Wherever it puts them, that is your telemetry. That is the data that you can use for diagnostics. Mm -hmm. And then you, you perform analysis against that telemetry, not only to try and figure out why something went wrong, why something went slow, or whatever, but also because you might be looking for trends. And uh, telemetry can give a great example is Internet Explorer. Um, you know, We went from one version to another, and the favorites button changed, or the favorites menu changed, right? And the location changed. It was a little harder to get to. And that's because of telemetry that showed us that people weren't using that, way, that, that oh, method. Oh, so you could bring something that was more popular to the forefront and move something that was to the background. That's right. It's not just about finding bugs. Mm -hmm. It's not just about making it faster. It's making it better. I mean, also, there's a, there's a lot of value in running um, instrumentation in a non-critical scenario because it allows you to establish a baseline so that you can then determine when you've deviated from that baseline. That's right. If you think it's going slow, how do you know if you don't know how it runs when it's not slow? Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And creating that initial baseline. And you may have several baselines when you're all done, because you may have baselines based on uh, device configuration. Mm -hmm. right? that, that's a big deal. Yep. OK, um, so let's talk specifically about performance counters. This is a, a Windows. Um, uh, Windows capability, I guess, is the best way to think of it. Uh, w performance counters are out there that you can leverage as a .NET developer. You can go and create new categories for counters, create new cat. So the .NET framework already has instrumentation baked into it. It does. It does. And well, no, the Windows Windows does. And uh, then the exposure of, of performance counters is through the .NET framework. Mm -hmm. And so, and then of course, you're uh, probably the framework has instrumentation, by the way, of its own. Yeah, you know? like memory allocation and those kind of things. Things, so you know what's going on. There. Yeah, but your app, it doesn't implement it for you, of course. It just allows you to easily kind of access the uh, performance counter subsystem inside Windows. And so perfor uh, performance counters are really a discrete number, and they're a number that reflects the current state. So um, let's say it is uh, how long it takes for a user to log in and this process of calling the database and, and encrypting their password, or whatever mm -hmm. it is, right? Um, you're going to measure that time with a stopwatch or something so that you can determine how long it takes. You're going to write that out to a counter, and that counter is going to say how long it just took. It's not going to keep an internal history of it, right? So if you do want that history and you do want trending, then you use tools, and they have tooling to be able to capture what the performance counters are, and then pull those down into some sort of store. And so we use like like performance monitor can yep. do something like that. It's a great great tool. Yeah, it's a tool that uh, we've all used um, to analyze other people's code that is slow because ours so far is not a big problem. With our three lines of code, <laughs> we kill it, don't we? Exactly. It's like yeah, you need to run code that runs this fast. That's right. So, uh, do you need any special privileges? Yeah, that's. I that? think that's important. Is that you can't just write to it, right? You can't have somebody with no privileges on this machine to go creating categories, creating performance counters. No, you do have to have the right permission. Uh, permissions change if you're just writing to it or mm -hmm. reading from it, but certainly to go and create new ones, you have to do something. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, okay. So let's see. The um, th this is a uh, this is a presentation or this is a snapshot of performance counter. It kind of shows the graph that uh, you can get back. It's it's uh, it's not necessarily real time, but it certainly can be real time. My screen, Barry. When you're done, guys. It's Barry, the my screen, please. It's the other one. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, it's about all about us, guys. Come on. <laughs> no, it's about the students. Um, okay. Yeah. 
Um, Stay on target. On, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Working. Got it. Okay. So uh, anyway, so this can show real time reading it as, as you know, almost it is actually connecting to it and treating it like a stream because this sort of trace information is very voluminous. And uh, so here I can pick the individual ones. This one is just the processor utilization, and you can start to see how it goes over time. But the code on this on the left shows how I can attach to it and I can read from it. Or in this case, I'm actually incrementing it. I can decrement it, of course. Mm -hmm. Set it to an explicit value as well. The most common is to increment or decrement a count. Um, there are raw values that are going to be important this, when, it, when you're coming to timing and things like that. Anyway, with this sort of data, once it's exposed, extremely, extremely valuable. What you do need to remember, though, as you write it out, um, it can be so voluminous that you start um, you start impacting the performance of your mm -hmm. app by measuring the performance of your app. Right? Exactly. Profiler for SQL Server is notorious for that, right? You go in, and you're like, what do you want to, there's something is wrong with the performance of this query. What do you want to listen to? Everything. Now your Stick query is so on. slower. Yeah, the yeah. tracing itself is the performance killer. So it is important to have all the instrumentation there, but it's also important to have some sort of mechanism or method that you can dial it down key in so that you don't have to have all of it being logged out. If nothing's going wrong, just leave it alone. And then, uh, and, and so that's, again, that goes back to trace listeners, which we talked about before. And the trace listener can implement switches then that determine the kind of the state of the environment. And so the cool thing about traces is obviously it can be part of a released application, and you can change it through the application configuration to toggle its, how verbose it is or whether it's on at all, yeah? Yeah, you don't want to beat up a, a, a production user, but you do want to deliver this into production because this is where problems happen. They never happen on your machine. They happen usually on the CEO's machine. That's kind of how it <laughs> If Normally CEO, around then. annual review time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let me pull up your app for a second. What is this dialogue that says close? All right, very good. And then we also have event logs. I think it's worth at least pointing out that event logs are an excellent. You may not have like deep instrumentation inside your application, but you may have some. And uh, you know, a user just logged in. A, uh, uh, an invoice was just submitted. Something like that. And there's no reason to, to not just use the event log for that. Mm -hmm. It's a great place to put high-level, major events inside your application. It's not really meant for performance measurement, but it's a great way to kind of debug scenarios so you can see what's yeah. going and on. And also capture diagnostic output, say, uh, if an error does occur, <laughs> you don't want to necessarily present to the user the uh, internal stack trace uh -huh. of what's going on. You're going to give them a user-friendly message, but you could drop out into the event log and write that stack trace. So, so that really you do two things when an error occurs. You do say to the user, we're sorry, right? You do. But you don't give them a whole bunch of mess. Yeah, don't scare but them. You give to Windows or the event log specifically specifically everything so that we can diagnose what's going on. You know, exactly. Why did that happen to you? Yeah. Yeah. Just also, reboot is usually what we do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's the truth, isn't it? All right. So uh, before we do anything, um, before we do this, let me pull up in Visual Studio here a project that has some performance issues. And uh, let's look at some of the built-in uh, diagnostic tools that we can use here that um, really solve, not solve the problem, but just give us a mechanism to um, diagnose it, be able to find out what What's going on wrong? What's going wrong? Okay. Whilst Jerry's bringing that one up, we just want to remind people to vote about the poll during the break. Reminder done. Yeah. Don't forget. There's a poll. Don't forget. Vote once. Vote often. That doesn't work right. Vote early. Vote often. Get your demo going. I don't know how vote often ever worked. All right. So. Uh, ah, here we are, diagnostic. It worked often Beautiful. in uh, Chicago, apparently. All right, let's take a look at an, an interesting method that we have called run. And so uh, run is a for loop. It goes from 0 to whatever it is I pass in. And then inside it is yet another for loop identical to it. And uh, it goes from 0 to the number I pass in. And then it adds to a variable, an N64 here. Um, whatever that number is. I don't know. But that this looks is a, like it might be a bad idea. This is all a bad idea. Oh, okay. This is this is we'll just call this, is this a, a best practice? performance simulator. No, okay. no, no, no. Of course it's a it's a best practice when you're simulating bad performance. Oh, I see. Yeah. I guess you'd simulate poor performance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that could be bad. All right, so here we are. Um, inside the uh, inside my app or when the application runs, um, I call these 
five methods. So this one is sort of nestled down here so I don't have to see it. These are the ones I want to investigate. I have a method called run one, two, three, four, and five. Each one executes a little bit longer or a little bit shorter of a loop that's going to go there. Okay. And you know, this sort of loop is difficult to optimize. It's a great way to show just burdening a system, right? Mm -hmm. So um, another thing I could have done is while true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked Somebody about that. we never got anything come back. Well, that's right. We do want it to end eventually, exactly. right? You can't diagnose eternity. You can, but it takes a while. <laughs> so here we go. I'm going to write Results it out. Results is infinity plus one. We know Consider. that it'll loop through, add these numbers together for us, and I will write out the value. And the only reason we're writing out the value is so that I can see um, that it's finished, right? So we'll go through five iterations. And so let me go ahead and do that. And you'll see it takes just a couple seconds to really go through these. And, you know, it takes, that one was quick, but this one's kind of hard. It's only getting harder now. And uh, so I, I had my processor, uh, let's see if I can uh, pull it up in time. I can't, I bet. Well, you can actually see it was peaked out, and then it dropped back down because the application just finished. Right? Okay. So I got to figure out what's we'll killing my thousands CPU. Wouldn't. What's that? We'll believe your thousands wouldn't. Yeah, thousands wouldn't. This is this is good, and so this happens. You know, when a, a user is trying to self-diagnose an application, this is almost all they've got, and so they'll pull this up and they're like, "Golly, my CPU is peaked out. What's going on?" It's pretty neat. All right, so I'll go through the same scenario, and uh, and but this time I'm going to select. To, to use the performance profiler. Okay. And so this is built into Visual Studio, and what it does is it will run my application, perform all the tasks just like I would, and uh, then it'll give me some feedback on what was actually going on. And because it's inside Visual Studio, when it does give me feedback, it won't say at this time it was this long. It can even tell me down to the method that was being called, down to the line that was being called. Show me. It's very powerful. Can I show you? Sure. All right, so it's under the Analyze. I want to make sure that everybody saw. Under the Analyze menu, I'll just select Launch Performance Wizard, and I'm going to just do implementation for now. This is the quickest way to uh, kind of show this off. It's going to ask which inside this solution. You know, we've got a lot, but the only one I really want to show is just this uh, one I've set up for it, Diagnostics After 26. I'll say Next. And uh, here we go. I'm going to say Finish. It'll launch my application. Of course, it's a self-running application, so I don't have to interact with it. So it'll go ahead and launch it. It'll so do right the now same it's, process. It's capturing all of the instrumentation outputs. That's right. OK. As well as all the common instrumentation, like CPU utilization, memory utilization. So this is an like example that. where it, the uh, observing it may actually change what's being observed. It, it, it could. Yes, that's exactly right. Cool. Um, just because the analyzer is there is running, it might actually um, dial down its performance a little right. bit. Yeah, absolutely, it could. Okay, so the, I uh, elect. I, there was a checkbox on, on the wizard that popped up the profiling report for me, and the profiling report shows me really interesting information. So along the bottom. Um, Along the bottom timeline here, it shows me in uh, in real time, real seconds, like wall clock time. They're saying, um, here's the application that ran. It ran 13 seconds, and then in the line itself is showing CPU utilization during that time, and. Uh, so this is good. It, it, it balanced out CPU utilization, but I want to be able to see, you know, inside this period what is going on, or I want to be able to drill into individual methods down below. But what's also nice is it, it uh, by default, gives me the, all the hot pads. So the hot pads are those methods um, that um, that take the longest, right, mm -hmm. as far as uh, as time. And so here I can see run three takes the longest of all. And so if we were to look at what one, run three does. Um, let me pull that uh, little sample Can you up, just click up. on it and I'll take you to it? Oh, yeah, sure will. Thank you. Yeah. So if we were to look at run three, that makes sense that it's the hottest on the hot path because it is 40,000 and everything else is a little bit lower. Okay. If we were to go back to that hot path and say, well, what's the what's next one after that? It had better be run five, right? Because that's the next one down. I mean, that's the way that it's measuring it. So if we go back to it, we can see three and then five, and then two and then four. And this is great. I'm seeing the application. Maybe I don't know yet what is really causing yeah. it, but it certainly gives me the place to start rather than just saying, how much RAM do you have installed? And so so obviously this is a contrived uh, demonstration scenario, but we would encourage everybody to run this on their existing applications just to get a good idea of what's going on. One of the uh, key traps that we sometimes fall into as developers is a single premature optimization, which is we look at something and we go, oh, I think this is going to be a waste of time and it's going to churn for too long and so on. The reality is this thing that we love so much, the compiler, is actually incredibly smart and will do an awful lot of optimization for you. It will look at an 
inefficient set of syntax and behind the scenes when it emits the intermediate layer, the output of this compilation, it will actually do some optimization. So don't presume that um, something that you see is going to be the slow. Prove it by using the profiler and do yeah. the analysis and then only spend your, your valuable time and energy rectifying problems or uh, performance hiccups that are actually identified by the tooling instead. This tooling is great because it's built into Visual Studio. We talked about before, there's third parties out there that do probably quite a bit more, right? Mm -hmm. But this is a great starting point and it almost takes away the excuse for developers. You know, I, well, I, you know, we don't have the tool. You do have the tooling. It's right here inside yep. Visual Studio and it makes your application that much better by adding uh, diagnostics around it. I could also include now um, custom performance counters that I have I'm incrementing as well right I yep. want to see you know how many people are logging in at once and different pieces like that exactly so really do an analysis to your domain the other point I want to point out is make sure that you do this profile analysis in the release build the the build that's going to go out to production because when you change your uh, build configurations in Visual Studio it enables optimization which will actually change the execution path of the code behind the scenes so you actually want to be uh, measuring performance on those uh, on the true environment rather than um, spending a lot of time and effort trying to uh, optimize your debug build Okay. Not every version of Visual Studio is going to include all of this advanced tooling, True. right? I'm using um, Ultimate right now, and you're going to need Ultimate, and I think Professional will include all of the diagnostics tools that we've shown tonight, or Correct. today, or whatever time it Correct. is. Correct. You won't get this in the Express Edition. It certainly will not get it in the Express Edition, also known as the free edition of Visual Studio. Absolutely. There's a v free version of Visual Studio for every technology that we have. Sure. Very, pla very good. So, um, you can control the cost of performance counters by... Um, you may, perhaps you could just um, you could write to them less frequently. You certainly don't want to do it too much. Um, you could the way that you measure inside your application. You need to think about that. And make sure that's not too costly as well. We well, want to add this instrumentation so that you can make your better your app better. But the core takeaway is. Don't add so much instrumentation that you have now made your application perform poorly because of it. Sure. Absolutely. So let's do a quick recap. OK. So uh, we, at the outset, we talked about splitting up assemblies and their assemblies relationship to projects. We also talked about sharing assemblies, um, be they through the uh, portable class library for a across platforms hmm. or by leveraging WinMD components for sharing across languages. We also just did a deep dive into uh, diagnostic capabilities and explored the value that the uh, performance profiling toolkit can provide in the ultimate and professional editions. That's right. Uh, one more reminder to all of our uh, audience here is that the code that we're using and some many of the examples that we aren't showing um, are all in uh, a solution that we made available to you. It's at xamlxaml.codeplex.com. You can find the Microsoft Virtual Academy link there. Download the solution, follow along with us, or go through at your own pace to learn things that we may have skipped because we just don't have time today. Great. And please remember, please vote. Please remember, please vote. Absolutely right. All right, we're going to take a 10-minute break. We'll see everybody soon. Goodbye.